the cloud. Okay, Nicholas, I think you're up. All right, so I think that's working. Let's try to uh, share the screen again. So welcome everyone. Uh, great, um, great session there, Vince. Thank you so much. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Marchetti is uh, um, quite humble um, in terms of uh, showing these these different examples and um, the kinds of uh, innovations that he's doing with the working group are, are really exciting. So I wanna thank you um, very much, Vince. Um, the, some of the things I'm going to present here, um, and I will, I will paste a, a link to a PDF into the chat in just a moment, but I wanted to make some acknowledgements. Um, we've been um, collecting some of this material through our uh, tutorials at IEEE VR. And so throughout the webinar, uh, maybe not today, but for sure tomorrow, is when we talk about authoring tools, we're gonna hear a lot about um, you know, the HLRS uh, 3D Studio Max exporter, um, all kinds of workflows that they're using in Germany uh, for geospatial CAD and, and all kinds of other data. So I wanna acknowledge um, my collaborators there. You know, uh, 3D, information that we get it all we get all kinds right there's all types of stuff and when we look at the largest um, networks computer interface in the world the web we start to see that there's uh, this huge variety of data and information and what was i think motivate what is motivating for all of us in the web 3d consortium community is being able to mash up share move this data around from different tools and because that's when it's you know value really becomes unlocked especially if you can get it out of a you know a proprietary licensed product and into anyone's hands with a, with a web browser so here we're seeing you know kind of like the range of x3d examples and i have a lot of links in this presentation which i hope you will follow with me but um Briefly, we're looking at geospatial uh, reconstructions from LIDAR data, and we're looking at, you know, deep uh, HPC physics simulations, like the stretching of DNA. Uh, here's the National Institute of Standards Technology making essentially a 3D textbook on the web, um, talking about complex engineering functions. Uh, complex CAD parts, here you're looking at that in a, in a web browser with Xfreedom. And, you know, we're also able to connect all kinds of devices to the web. And that's sort of one of the really exciting things, whether it's a, a tablet with a touch screen or a joystick uh, or a game controller or a set of immersive trackers like I might have uh, with a headset or a cave type of example. The main thing about Web 3D is, yes, it's... Um, you know, interactive 3D graphics, um, but that's the, the sort of analogy to HTML, and I'll revisit this again, is the way that you can compose um, different kinds of data. So we're looking at assets like textures or models that may live out there somewhere on the web um, at some URL. And if we can grab that asset, that texture, and put it into our world, then we're doing web 3D, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we've been really excited at Virginia Tech to, uh, to be working with Vermal and X3D all these years, and we've been able to um, really stay at the front edge of research um, because we're able to put these kinds of elements together and these different kinds of data sets. So one of the things about the standards is that uh, this, the content that we built in 1998, right, still runs. And it um, hasn't been touched 
the need to recompile it. It's running on operating systems and uh, systems that we never dreamed of before. So here's kind of a, an example of my uh, well, my first Vermal World uh, in 1998. It's the Giza Pyramids and uh, a bit of an adventure place where you can go and listen to music and uh, shop and that sort of thing, learn about the, uh, the alien connection. But there you see uh, in the bottom right is in my cave at, in my lab at Virginia Tech. It's the exact same file. Um, you know, that I wrote in 1998, but I'm running it in 2020. And I'm running it on Linux, which didn't exist then. I'm using, you know, broadband networks, didn't exist then. Caves with 200 to uh, 27.4 million pixels, right? They didn't exist back then, but the content survives. So that's why uh, we're, we're so excited about being part of this community and, and why we work on, on standards. So what I'd like to do, next is to maybe start uh, by going to web3d.org and just sort of show us a couple of things that are over there um, which are easily accessible and then uh, we'll go over to the powerpoint again because um do we have links uh, in there so why don't i i'll drop this um link into the chat See that folks get it. I'm going to send it to the panelists and attendees. So this is a draft, uh, but it has the most of the, the links that we're going to that we're going to visit here today. So feel free to follow along and uh, check up on the, the final version once we're once we're done. Okay, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. I'm going to go to web3d.org and um, so. Vince has showed us some really neat things about what happens in an X3D scene. And um, certainly we're going to look at some, some really interesting standalone examples. Um, but a lot of the, the real exciting stuff lately is happening with this mix of HTML5 and, and so the 2D and the 3D interface and kind of wiring up new services that are out there. So I just draw your attention to this uh, spinning globe um, at the top. And if you take a click on that, it'll open a new uh, window for you. One of the things that we had a question about um, earlier about, you know, using large, uh, dealing with large city model data, for example, large geospatial data. In, in VRML and X3D, there's the concept of a level of detail. So our LOD node is something that lets us, for example, as we get closer to an object, load more detail. Okay, so here's, I'm, I'm really zoomed in on, on a high level of detail. And that's sort of the interesting part, right? Is I'm, if I click on a place on the map, which is in 3D, right? It's gonna take that and submit a lat long query to a weather service, and I can get right back um, the weather at that location, okay? So not only is it 2D and 3D working together in the same web page, but also connecting to some uh, service or script or a CGI script somewhere out on the web, right? Getting data from a URL. And this is something that um, I think provides a lot of possibilities. So I know people here want to learn X3D. So let's do my favorite trick, right? Which is how do they do this? Well, if you control U in your browser, you'll get to the source of the page, okay? And um, you can see we're just in our HTML page. There's some, some groups, some stuff, the viewpoints that uh, Vince mentioned. But what's really doing the work here is uh, these sets of scripts here where I'm mapping my spherical coordinates, right, to lat, or to lat long, my touch point to lat long. A couple of JavaScript helper functions. Um, Okay, so whenever you're interested to see sort of like, how does it work, check old control U and uh, you'll be able to see the source. And so that will be true for a, a lot of these um, examples that we go to. Let me go forward to uh, one of these. This one's pretty good. So dealing with large models, there's several different ways to do it. But as I mentioned that 
if it lives at a URL, right, we can we can use it in our scene. Um, so I'm going to go down to this. Uh, any of these banner examples have uh, links that you can go and uh, view the content. So once upon a time, this model was considered too big to, to render, uh, even on silicon graphics machines. And here it is streaming into my web browser. Uh, it's pretty peppy. Um, but you see we've got a, an oil rig. There's some nice uh, texturing going on here. It's kind of like a maybe a game um, sort of look and feel, I guess. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to show you was this the example of this 2D and 3D. So up here we have a slider that's in HTML5, and it is going to send events as I move here to the position, the, or actually the orientation of my light. So I can control the light in the 3D scene with the slider in the HTML page. We're going to see more examples of this too. But another sort of a uh, thing to make sure we're all looking at is, um, yeah, these are real-time shadows. So as I move the uh, the sun position with my slider, you can see the shadows are are growing longer. There's noon and growing longer again. So kind of a fun example of 2D and 3D. And I encourage you guys to, um, oh, I was going to do something else. I was going to show the control U. Control U. <clears throat> so there's some scripts that are driving the waves. We can skip that. Uh, but we go down here. OK, there's our X3D scene information. Got our, X, our tags like we're used to seeing in the XML encoding. And this is the mechanism I wanted to to draw your attention to the inline node okay so the inline node lets us build more complex scenes out of simpler ones so if you want to have a car a tree a building you can basically pull in those x3d files with this simple mechanism and they can live under a transform and be located or under levels of detail for example okay so there's um a few more things we should look at. Let's go to um, the bottom of our page, and it says case studies. There's a few new ones on here, which I, I'd like to show you guys. Um, well, the first, I guess um, we can look at uh, the Spiders 3D collaborative walkthrough planning. So someone was talking about, you know, large cities and environments, and I'm going to scroll down. There's a uh, a link here on the NPS GitLab, and it has a video link, which is why I wanted to um, share. It's actually 18 minutes, um, so we won't actually watch it here. But I wanted to show you where it was, and maybe a quick sort of flavor of what. Let's see if it'll go. I want to sort of let it get to some uh, some imagery here. So we're dealing with um, lots of different uh, fixed assets like buildings. We're dealing with things that move like trucks, um, trying to keep things safe, efficient. And uh, really, the, the Navy and uh, Synergy Software um, have been working to develop this platform, which is an X3D database uh, of all of these uh, naval sites, installations, and uh, buildings, objects, and uh, put them in a collaborative web platform so that basically decision makers can quickly put together different kinds of information, different scenarios, and share them online. So we don't have to travel to uh, a location to be able to assess, um, you know, will the sub fit there or not? Um, and we can get multiple stakeholders into, into this environment. So here you've got a, a really an enterprise industrial strength pipeline for 
CAD, GIS, and BIM data, and the way that we bring it together outside the proprietary platforms is extensible 3D. So I just wanted to share that case study with you and uh, some resources. Be sure to check that out. Um, there's another one here, which <clears throat> we will touch on in terms of geospatial data and scientific data. So this is from one of our members, Monterey Bay Research uh, Institute. And they're running robots all through Monterey doing sampling of biological and hydrological properties. And so if you um, follow um, some of these links, you can get to the tool, it's online. Um, they've published a whole bunch of their scientific missions for chlorophyll, salinity, all kinds of um, relevant uh, factors. And you can do sort of 2D and 3D data exploration. I encourage you to check that one out. There's a few others in here which we will um, which we will get to. I guess we can look at um, the Zebrafish Brain Browser for a second, because this is one that's um, close to, to my heart. Um, there's a link here, so you can go right to it. <clears throat> As uh, Vince mentioned, when we went to X3D3, from VRML, we added volume rendering. And this is a tool that some of my students built on their summer internships at NIH. Uh, this is the Burgess Lab, where they're studying uh, different kinds of genomes and gene expression in the neurology of the zebrafish. The zebrafish is sort of like the classic um, animal to study the early nervous system. And this has been a, a really great success. So you can see we've got our kind of typical flat views and slicing in, but we also have the interactive 3D view where we can turn on or off different layers, um, possibly turn up some contrast of uh, different groups. Maybe I want to, you know, uh, load some anatomical reference into the frame. And this is volume rendering uh, right in the web browser. You can see this is just at a URL. There's some nice things here. You can uh, you know, download the current image stack that you're working with, um, do different kinds of searches, and of course, turning on and off different kinds of cues. So a, when they say lines, they're talking about genetic lines. Um, so that's what you're basically turning on and off. And as you browse through these, you can see that these genes are really not related in terms of uh, at least the red and the green in terms of proximity. And they do things like study what is the function and the meaning of that. All right, so the Zebrafish Brain Browser has uh, is being used by this scientific community all over the world. And uh, we're getting lots of positive feedback from uh, from the researchers using it. But it's all just X3D volumes and uh, an HTML5 interfaces. Okay, so I think we're going to get through, um, <clears throat> I'll leave you guys on those case studies for a second, and let you explore, and I'll go back to my slides. Um, let's see. All right, so we looked at um, some of the case studies on web3d.org and uh, looking at the banner world and just getting a sense of, okay, I've got an X3D file and I can put it into a web page. Where is all this living? So um, Dr. Marchetti mentioned the standalone browsers, browsers versus the HTML5 browsers. And that's exactly right, because X3D lives above the rendering layer, right? If I don't know if some people remember uh, DirectX, or maybe people use Pavray, those are the rendering layers. Those are what's talking to the hardware, right, at the very low level. Um, X3D and VRML can be rendered with any of those. WebGL, OpenGL, DirectX, I've seen it rendered in Pavray. 
Um, so we're building this data structure, the scene graph, that's above all of the rendering calls. And that's where we build our application. So we don't need to keep track of every triangle. Um, if you tried to make a cube in OpenGL, you're doing 83 lines of compiled C code. And uh, you saw what Vince was able to do with the text editor. So kind of bringing up some analogies here. Um, we're talking about that same sort of thing. It's a document, a content model like HTML. So the same way as HTML, your X3D world has audio, video, text, you know, images. Uh, and what your X3D file does, or your HTML files, describe how they're put together. How do they work together, right? Where are things? Um, what happens when you click something? So similarly, it's platform independent, can script it with JavaScript, among other things. Um, and uh, if you know about XML, some of those advantages of uh, validation for the scene uh, can be done with the DTD and schema. So any XML tool is an X3D tool. We're living above the rendering library. We call that a scene graph. And basically, this is a, a data structure that describes all of this stuff. Um, the animation and the behaviors. So I've put in a, a, a small kind of way to um, visualize it. it, helps me uh, to think about um, this graph, the scene graph, and it literally is. So, you know, you saw with um, Vince's examples having transforms above shapes and uh, the shapes maybe having some geometry and appearance, right? And we talked about lights. Um, so in this case, right, with the, uh, if this point light was just a default, it was not global, right, it's only going to light up these two shapes. And that's useful. If I only want to have a light on in a room, and I don't want that light to be bleeding out into other rooms, I'm going to take advantage of this hierarchical scoping, right, of my lights. And maybe if I want someone to, when they click on this switch, with the touch sensor, I want the light to turn on, right? So there's these routes, uh, which also then showed you about. Okay, there is lots of stuff out there and it can be kind of overwhelming. So I'm hoping that these webinars are helpful to, um, to frame um, these technologies in a useful way. There's no shortage of information for the curious. Um, this is uh, something that came up earlier, and I'll also uh, emphasize that too. X3DGraphics.com is that book um, by uh, Brutzman and Daly. And one of the things that I think might be worth us visiting is this URL here. Oops, not a good one. Uh, let's see. All right, so I'm going to find this. I just wanted to show the, um, this is the tip of the iceberg, honestly, um, but these are in the Web3D Consortium's example archives. And there are lots of things in here. Um, <clears throat> and they're organized different ways. But one thing I'd like to kind of draw your attention to, I'm just going to drill down into one of these uh, worlds, let's say. These were um, generated by uh, XSLT style sheet from an XML file, and we just made some X3D. But so one of the things that is neat about the example archives at web3d.org is this up here in the upper right. Nicholas, uh, you might be on the wrong screen. Were you looking at your web browser? Mm, I am indeed. Let me try that again. Sorry, folks. How about this one? All right, great. <clears throat> Looking good. Auto-generated. So this is sort of the one of the real advantages of, of X3D, right, is that that scene graph is the same no matter what language it's in, right, or encoding it's in. 
right? It might be in vermal, it might be in X2D, it might be in binary, right? It's the same scene graph. And so you kind of get to um, observe with these examples, not only the, all of the different um, encodings, but even some pretty printed, um, to see the scene graph pretty printed in HTML5. So it's the, from one file every night, the content um, examples archive generates the whole website with all of these different encodings. It's all automagic. And the reason that it works is because of the standard. Okay, now let's see if I'm on my web browser, then maybe I will. <clears throat> Go to another URL because this also came up, which was um, how X3D4 lets us pull in GLTF models. And so I wanted to share this uh, this blog with you mostly because of the examples that are here. Um, and I'll pop up two here really quickly. Um, I'm sorry. But here we are at the X Freedom um, example uh, page where we're we're loading a GLTF model in an X3D scene, and we're getting all of that that goodness of PBR rendering. Okay, and how is this happening? The inline node, same inline that we mentioned earlier. Um, so the GLTF can be inlined as a into an X3D scene, right? And you get all of that nice, all those nice materials. But it can also be uh, used interactively. So we wanted to uh, go to this other example. That's what X3D is good for. So we, the same way that we would in a web page put together. Uh, some images and they want to be JPEGs, right? We want them to be small. GLTF is like, uh, GLTF is to X3D as JPEG is to HTML, right? So I can put a GLTF model somewhere in my X3D world, right? I can wire it up for interactivity and the logic of my application, but I'm basically just using that as an asset Right, here's a CAD model from GLTF, but I'm able to do this manipulation using the X3D scene graph. So when you need to add interactivity, uh, lighting, and some other things, this is where you want to kind of step above GLTF and compose your application in X3D. All right, so I wanted to share that, and that's some exciting uh, news. Looks like. Um, this has also put some uh, some examples up. So GLTF and X3D playing well together on the web. All right. So I'm going to pop back to my slides again. All right, so that's kind of the 30,000 foot view of this scene graph. And we've talked about these different encodings. And the codings, you can tell them by the name of the file extension, right? wrl.x3d.x3dv. And there's lots of tools to, um, to get data into these ISO formats. I wanted to talk about um, one of uh, the main ways that we do this. Yes, we can use translation tools or you know, export something from, from the authoring tool, but very often we're writing our own scripts to make an X3D file or maybe to clean an exported X3D file. So for example, uh, Python um, is a great data manipulation tool, scripting tool. But if you uh, wanted to read in a bunch of um, coordinates from an STL file, put them into a coordinate node of a X3D, 
it's a few short lines of Python, right? It's just text manipulation. So yes, you can use all of these tools, Blender, Max, Rhino, Paraview, Agisoft, Point Fuse. Um, there's lots of tools that you can literally save as or export um, X3D. There are um, <clears throat> uh, several different editors that are geared specifically to X3D SyncGraph, um, Titania and X3D Edit being two. Um, let's see, PostGIS, that has an X3D exporter also. Um, and then there's two tools that, that we actually use a lot. They're, they're commercial, uh, industrial grade conversion tools, Okino Polytrans and Safe Softwares FME. So they both support X3D and, and, and quite well. Um, to sort of start a story, um, yes, the scientific community and the research community, the people who were doing 3D 25 years ago, um, have been uh, building their tools around this principle, uh, which is basically that we wanna be able to have this data be shared and non-proprietary. So all of these tools that the, have been worked on and uh, used in biochemistry, chemical engineering, et cetera, export Vermal or X3D. And here you can see um, some protein data bank data put out uh, on the 3D print exchange, and then we can fly through it in uh, my cave or on the web page. So probably the I'd like us to take a quick tour over to 3dprint.nih.gov and just kind of show us there again, case studies. Um, so let's go, let's go there. I'm gonna have to change my screens again, going back and forth. All right, great. So the NIH, right, is about knowledge sharing. And uh, so their, their mission is very compatible with international standards. And um, there's a few exciting collections here. Um, I think we can talk some of these about um, their great reaction to this COVID crisis was basically, this is a website where you can upload, download, and share and build um, 3D models that then you can print, print yourself or send off to be printed. And there's a whole group of collections here. Um, it's everything from personal protective equipment um, to, you know, virus models to prosthetics, uh, pediatric heart surgeries. Um, it's, it's very impressive. And so I encourage you all to um, take a visit. Let's go see about um, our, our COVID. <clears throat> so they've done a, a very nice job bringing this forward to the public. If you find it something that you're really interested in uh, exploring, they have a, I'll just show you briefly the, the main features here. Well, uh, I can get a 3D preview. And we'll let that load. And I can also download. I think we're loading here. There it goes. All right, so here is uh, the X3D file previewed in the web page. Uh, I can do some things like yeah, make it full screen, which is pretty cool. I'll take a second to draw again, but it will come. And then you can download several formats, right? So you can download STL, right? But that's going to be monochrome. STL doesn't support color. And that is why the NIH went with X3D, is because we can print each of these different pieces out in a different color. OK. So let's go back. And uh, if you go to the download page, uh, you can see that those are what they're uh, publishing. You can actually get Vermal, STL, a zip of all of that, or some X3D files. And one of the things that <clears throat> is uh, 
that is great about the 3D print exchange, of course, and having color in your prints is that uh, it's supported by all of the main 3D print tools like Cura, the open source G code, uh, for example. You can drag your X3D model in and it will print it. Uh, send it off to use to Shapeways or use NetFab. And so this has been a really exciting thing that anything we can put in the web page now or in the VR headset, we can also 3D print. Um, I will, there's not much on this case study uh, that I'll show, but just to be aware of another one of our members, uh, they're doing high resolution uh, body scans of uh, people for uh, health and also uh, apparel. Um, and so they're doing an amazing, amazing work. But one of the reasons that they really went with X3D was that X, it's extensible, right? So OBJ was a default and it worked for a while, but you know, you fragmented files and your MTLs over there and there's no metadata speed. So they're bringing uh, their newest product out with um, X3D support. And we're really, really excited about that. We looked at this one uh, through the case studies of the, uh, Zebrafish brain browser. Um, this is stuff that you can do. Um, so I'm happy to um, alert you to this website, which is pretty neat. And then of course the, the actual scripts that you would use to take a stack of images and create an X3D compatible volume rendering. Okay, so this was from our, uh, our work with, um, sorry, our members Vcom Tech in, in San Sebastian, Spain, uh, have been real leaders in the volume rendering uh, work. This professor uh, Hoffman and uh, Bon has uh, basically published hundreds of specimens for his students in X3D and in X3D volume rendering. So I do hope you check this out. Uh, it's quite impressive. We looked at this of them through the case studies, the worldwide uh, facilities for uh, for the Navy. And a lot of those similar issues came up in our 3D Blacksburg. So here at Virginia Tech, we built a, a high resolution model of our town and it's been used for several different kinds of applications. Um, I'll describe a few of those, but we did um, some town planning, right? So they uh, had some models in SketchUp of what this new block would be like, but how do you know what it feels like to walk down the street and figure out if, you know, the buildings are too close, too far? Um, this was going to require some zoning changes, right? So we brought uh, the town council in. We, well, we converted the model into X3D. We put it into 3D Blacksburg. And then we're able to have this really interactive uh, group review and processing of that design. And that was published there. Um, it's not just 3D models uh, and things that come from tools. So I think maybe what I'd like to do with this next little section here is uh, focus on some other kinds of media. Um, but lots of people are able to um, right, take, uh, well, we have 3D, spherical cameras, sorry, just spherical cameras, right? Panoramic 360 views. Um, they do video, they do audio. Uh, and so we've been using that a lot. We're an agricultural um, university, a land grant university. And so we work a lot with landowners and land management practices. And here's an example um, where we're working with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy on their new viewshed protocol uh, how do you assess a landscape? And the only way to do that is to visualize it and see and debate on what are the different points. So here we're looking out over the New River and you can see across the valley um, one, of the, one of the high points. Uh, we do this with um, forestry as well. So here we are training uh, extension agents on land management practices. And instead of visiting five, uh, you know, three farms in a day, they actually visited five farms in an hour and no boots got wet, uh, but the same um, principles were conveyed. Uh, 
So I will bring, um, it's time to get to some more uh, examples, I guess. Um, so I'm gonna go back with the last little bit of time and show a few more, and then um, we can hang out and, and take some questions. All right, so I'm gonna show you guys some, oh, show you guys some things about this one. So this is actually a um, forest location up in Ithaca, New York. And when we went there, we had a handheld scanner and we were taking scans of uh, different ways of growing shiitake logs. This is something you might wanna teach someone. You can see they're using shade, um, cloth, and you can also even see over here sort of the density of the pegs, the inoculant that they've put in. Mm -hmm. So I'll just go through a few viewpoints. And what we did was we did this. We mashed it up with 360 photos. All right. So here's um, Professor Monsell. I, I just scanned him while he was counting his ramps patch. <laughs> and taking a census. So we've been able to take an on-site scanned model, put it into a place that is a real location and add photorealistic content to it as well. So here's uh, you know, um, the, the golden seal nursery, or maybe we go over to where they're growing some uh, ginseng in these, in these cages, All right? But they're just spheres sitting around uh, in, in their specific locations. So a mashup is, uh, and now I'd like to um, take us to another one. I've been working with the USGS quite a bit. And um, this project has been a lot of fun. Um, we did a survey uh, over 2000 um, K through 12 students uh, participated in our fish count. And what we did is we took them um, to specific locations. And you can see here, actually, I'm in a photosphere. I've got that same model uh, kind of at the middle. Maybe using my web page, I can go between some different species. But I can also put them in different places. So maybe if I load pool three, um, I'm not sure if you guys can hear the audio, but that's just an MP4 video from the Sphere camera, spherical camera, uh, mapped onto the inside of an X3D Sphere. Of course, we can change different things. One of the things I like about this uh, little example too is that if you wanted to, you know, send send a wish you were here, uh, you can take a little screenshot. And, uh, make a postcard. So the USGS uh, Trout Education and Survey, it's uh, one of my um, favorites. Let's see, I mentioned about SketchUp. Um, if we're thinking about, um, again, some government folks, I'll take you to one more. We did the MPEG video audio, which is actually at my students page. So this is the Jefferson lab example. Um, so here we actually used a pipeline uh, using the scientific visualization software called Paraview, which is something that the Department of Energy uses quite a bit. This is uh, the class 12 magnet at Jefferson Lab. Um, this is where they shoot electron beams at uh, protons and neutrons, blow it up, and then try to see what, what it was that they blew up <laughs> and understanding um, basically the distribution of quarks and gluons in the, uh, in the nucleus, in the nucleon. So here's an example of that kind of 2D, 3D interface that we've been talking about and we're excited about. There's the magnet. Um, but I can turn on or off different parts of this apparatus. This is literally like three meters tall. Um, maybe where are the detector wires in this uh, in in the object? Maybe I want to uh, look at a couple of trajectories. Right. So here's some 
uh, lines that we are shooting in and the photon and the particles coming out and going through the detector. Okay. Using wireframes so we don't get a lot of occlusion. Um, maybe I'll share uh, this one. <clears throat> This might be an older version of it on Ali's site, but uh, what's happening inside the, the proton and the neutron is really pretty cool. There's two opposing forces. There's a pressure distribution. One of them's pushing out and one of them's pushing in. And so we used Paraview again to create this uh, visualization with a cutaway. And it's going to load in just a second. with all the glyphs. So you can see now we've got the, in, the pressure going in, these arrows, and the pressure going out, the equal scale. So being able to, again, connecting the web with all these different kinds of data, whether it's GIS or BIM or scientific visualization, um, X3D makes it all happen. Maybe I'll show one more thing because folks might not know, but um, the uh, web VR, we've been doing web VR for several um, years in X Freedom. And that's why I've got this little headset down here. If I double click that, you can see I'm, I'm in my H HMD mode now. I've got my stereo uh, view. So that's a Chrome extension that lets me test uh, web VR compatibility. OK. Well, let's see. So we've. We've gone through some, <clears throat> some exciting examples. There's more in the slide set. Um, and of course, more uh, online that I wasn't able to. It was not an exhaustive um, all right, inventory. Let me bring up my slides again to make sure that uh, I didn't miss anything that we really want to see here. Let's do this. <clears throat> All right. Um, yeah, so from, from the, the slide set, you can link to uh, some heritage examples, more Smithsonian, and how we're putting the metadata into uh, X3D files. Also, the NIST um, 3D environment yeah so i think we'll just go back to um the slides and then work through any questions it looks like there's some stuff maybe on the um on the chat so we'll take a second to check that um i really have enjoyed the time um today and uh, i want to thank vince and anita havele of course for for helping to uh, to make this webinar happen uh there's lots of great examples out there, lots of things you can do. And uh, remember, control you. It's your friend. Uh, you can see what's under the hood. And what's really neat about X3D is that you can uh, get in there and wrench around with nothing but a text editor um, or an XML tool. But then there's all kinds of other uh, ways to generate and build your scenes. All right, so let's Take a moment and I will bring up the, uh, the chat. There's some Q&A in here. Um, okay, we maybe we had did these already. Let me see. A knowledge is a prerequisite for someone who's new to this. Yeah, so we did sort of touch on that. Um, uh, you know, my... Um, feeling on this is uh, it's not really about a knowledge. It's more about uh, an attitude, right? It's a prerequisite, um, which is one of curiosity. Uh, you know, it's about tinkering. And um, that's why when you get to something as extensible as X3D, you know, I mean, the web is literally the limit, okay, for what you can do. Um, so I think uh, a curiosity that, you know, I only go in and change that. What happens if I do this? Oh. Um, 
The other thing I could say is, uh, so I would say there's more of an attitude is the prerequisite. Um, but also that part of that attitude is knowing what you don't know. Um, and so this is where our community uh, comes in. Um, we have uh, member mailing lists where we do a lot of substantive work, but there's also a public mailing list. So X3D Public, for example, uh, which is similar to the old, to the www.vermal list, uh, which is actually still alive. Um, that is where you can ask questions, um, post examples. Um, literally in 98 to 2000, that's how I learned. I would start hacking and something didn't work and I would think about it and then ping the community and someone uh, sort of raised their hand and said, yeah, this is how you do that. Um, and so I think that's another part of the, uh, the attitude, which is um, playing well on the web and ask for help. There's a, there's a great global resource here uh, in this technology. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to see what you all can do with it. So join us, uh, web3d.org is, uh, is the website. There's lots of resources there. Um, I might mention too, I don't know if it's come up um, yet, but there is a new website about x3d4.0. I'm going to go back to my browser just um, quick to uh, to do this. Let's see. Is that a web browser you guys can see? So <clears throat> web3d.org. The first thing um, as, a, as a parting shot here is to draw your attention to the top news story which is uh, we've released the X34 specification uh, for public review. Uh, this will come back to the membership uh, later this year to vote on before it goes to ISO. But we wanted to share all of our work with the GLTF, projective texture mapping, all those new features and goodness in X34 with the community and to get some early feedback. So um, make sure you take a look at the, um, the new draft for spec. And it might also be a little um, overwhelming going to going to web3d.org. <clears throat> we have another website that's kind of a new front door for the X3D4 standard, and I encourage you guys to take a look at this one too. Webx3d.org. And here you'll see some more kind of examples, resources, maybe some quick access things that you can hop onto and, uh, and hopefully use. Okay, so that's webx3d.org. Some examples and resources, that sort of thing. So I'm gonna go to the chat here. Oh good, thank you, somebody pasted that in. Okay. Um, you can always follow us on uh, Twitter. There's also a consortium Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, page, and we have uh, a YouTube channel. So you can find lots of more, lots more resources. Uh, for example, here, right on the YouTube and uh, in the Twitter, you can get to those links right off the home page. So we hope you all have fun with X3D and I appreciate your, uh, your time joining us today. Make sure you ping us, uh, drop a line on X3D Public, uh, join up, we'll see, you, um, see you on the web. So thanks very much. I'll hang here for a little bit if there's any other Q&As that come up. Um,